Good morning, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I am the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute and a member of the Steering Committee for the Sustainable Energy Coalition. And we are very proud to welcome you here to uh, this morning's, or to today's 16th Annual Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo and Policy Forum. This forum is co-sponsored uh, in conjunction with the Congressional, uh, both the House and the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses, as well as you can see on your program as a number of other Congressional Caucuses as well. And so we are delighted that everyone has joined together in terms of saying that it is very, very important that we really have a better understanding of the enormous um, uh, is, uh, information that is available uh, to have a better understanding of what really is happening in this country with regard to technology development and how much it is being deployed across this country and indeed across the world. So let's start off our first panel uh, this morning uh, to get an overview and we're going to hear from speakers with regard to solar, uh, geothermal and from the overall business side embracing uh, a look at, at a variety of efficiency and renewable technologies. Our first speaker, Scott Sklar, who's the president of the Stella Group. Also, Scott is an adjunct at George Washington University and the chair of the Sustainable Energy Coalition's steering committee. Scott? Thank you, Carol. Thank you all. Um, I want to say, uh, uh, actually, my uh, printer got, did not uh, deliver my newest update, but there have been 27 clean energy studies done by various institutions. And if you read them in aggregate, they conclude that high value energy efficiency and renewable energy can meet most or all of the global or U.S. energy needs with existing technology we have today. This idea that this is out there in the end of the 21st century is absurd. And the issue is, in up here on Capitol Hill and in the media, and frankly in many planners and in businesses that I had deal with, we fixate on one technology or another. But actually it's the blend that gets you where you need to go. The three newest best studies that I like <clears throat> are the Business Council Bloomberg study, which you will hear from, so I will not get into it right now. World Resources Institute puts out the REN21 study, uh, which is number 16 on this little paper I gave you. It's supported by the United Nations, and they do an aggregate of what's going on globally. And they just released uh, their uh, 2012 review that said that uh, private sector investment in renewables globally reached $269 <clears throat> billion. Now, when I started in this field 30 years ago, it did, the whole renewables didn't reach $100 million. So $269 billion, and that's just private sector in investment. If you look at governments around the world, federal and local governments, it's another $817 billion a year. So we're looking at a trillion dollars worth of investment in these clean technologies per year and growing at double digits. The third uh, that's worth your uh, look at is also a United Nations, and that is their Sustainable Development Office, and they put out a study directly. It's called UNDESI, D-E-S-I. And they show globally again that the developing world, and we have 7 billion people on this planet now, one third have no electricity or water, and another third get electricity less than 10 hours a day. And that their conclusions are the only option are a set of high value energy efficiency and renewables. So here's the deal. The Institute of Local Self-Reliance, number five, on this brochure shows that 36 states in this country can meet most, can meet all of their energy needs. 
with their portfolio of renewable energy resources in the state. And that the other 14 states can easily be powered by the overages uh, from these other states. And even the worst state can meet about 30 percent of its electricity needs. Uh, so it's, it's pretty astounding. So here's the uh, one 10-second nutshell on these studies. Oak Ridge National Lab shows that waste heat and combined heat and power it be, can meet 8 percent of our electricity needs. This is, remember, I want you to think about something. What does nuclear and natural gas and coal and heavy oil all have in common? They create steam to generate electricity. Here we're dumping heat into the air from industrial processes. Why would we not want to take that heat and make electricity? It's, it's free heat. No emissions. 24 hours a day, by the way. Water energy, the EPRI study, 10 percent. These are, by the way, all conservative. I picked the lowest numbers in these studies. By the way, most people live next to water, either on rivers or near the ocean. MIT study, geothermal, 10 percent. Uh, uh, combined lab study led by Oak Ridge, biomass, only waste, not new crops, not food like corn, just waste. Biomass can meet 20 percent of our electricity needs sustainably. By the way, electricity and thermal needs. Um, <clears throat> Sandia and a combined land study, concentrated solar power, heat from the deserts. So this is using the thermal side of solar, 10 percent. Uh, Navigant, rooftop photovoltaics and solar thermal, 12 percent. And then National Renewable Energy Laboratory wind, 20 percent. By the way, if you add all that up, it's more than 100 percent. And that's the point. And these are the most conservative numbers not the high-end numbers. So I want to leave you here with a couple of thoughts. First of all, there's a lot of prestigious institutions that say the portfolio can deliver now. Secondly, the resources we have, the United States in particular, is resource rich in renewable technology. As the American Council on an Energy Efficient Economy can tell you, another great nonprofit here, that we can reduce our load within five-year paybacks by 20 percent with high-value energy efficiency. I have a zero-energy home. I have a zero-energy office building. I just finished a zero-energy, a self-generating building at the Washington Navy Yard. What we were able to do is reduce the loads of these buildings by 55 percent. So then you need less to power them uh, with, the, with the renewable technologies I have on board. And by the way, those two buildings are all a few minutes from here, so if anybody wants a tour, come to my table. I also want to remind you that renewables, you know, there's this view that renewables are intermittent. Well, of the five, geothermal, water, and biomass, they're not intermittent. They're 24-hour power. Solar, actually, is your perfect midday power source. That's when we use more power. It is nonsense what I read sometimes that it costs utilities more. No, in fact, they have to bring in higher cost electricity midday or turn on their older, less performing, polluting plants midday or wheel power in from some other utility midday. And when the sun's hotter is when you need more power. When it's cloudy, you need less power. It's naturally compatible. So, and what we're seeing with wind in terms of driving down costs on land, and it will be less cost and for longer periods offshore, we will have a set of solid solutions. My ending statement is, these technologies are manufactured here. Don't believe all this media stuff. Yes, we have big manufacturers in China, as everywhere else, but we have new photovoltaic plants and wind turbine plants and parts for geothermal and combined heat power in the United States of America. So don't assume that it's all being imported. It is not. So thank you very much. And again, please come to the Stellar Group table. Happy to answer any questions. Or take my course at GW. Take care. Great. Thanks, Scott. <laughs>
So now we'll hear from someone who is representing businesses who are actually providing these technologies that Scott was talking about, the immense resources um, that are there to use. Ruth McCormick, who is a Senior Policy Associate for the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, will talk about that. So I have a visual, which Carol's going to help me show. I know, no PowerPoints, but I did bring a visual. We think this tells a very compelling story, and what I want to do today is talk a little bit about the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and some of the work that we've been doing recently that will um, provide information about the impact that these clean energy technologies have been having on the U.S. economy and on the energy sector. So I'm Ruth McCormick with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, which is a group of businesses from a broad portfolio of clean energy technologies. We include a broad portfolio of renewable energy technologies, hydro, wind, solar, geothermal, fuel cells, biomass. We also include energy efficiency companies and associations, and also natural gas. And together these businesses have been working together on policy development for over 20 years which we think is a very strong story in and of itself, the fact that they've been partners for that long. In commemoration of the Council's 20th anniversary, they had a report commissioned by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which is a leading market research firm, the purpose of which was to provide an updated market report on really what was going on in these business and energy sectors with these technologies. As Scott was saying, that it's not just one technology that's really having an impact, but to get a real understanding of what's going on in the U.S. energy system, it's important to look at this suite of technologies. So we were finding that people tend to silo their look at these industries, and they might know a lot about wind, or they might know a lot about natural gas, but they didn't necessarily know a lot about fuel cells or biomass or, or hydropower. So it was important to provide, for policymakers in particular, the most up-to-date information about really what was happening in the market. So Bloomberg's report shows some interesting facts that we wanted to share with policymakers on the federal level and on the state level, as well as with the investment community, anyone who's really interested in knowing what's happening on the ground. So the book is called, or the report is called, Sustainable Energy in America Fact Book 2013. This is an infographic which, again, visually displays some of the key findings of the report. I have some of these displayed on the table outside the room here, and we also have a table inside the expo if you want to get those copies and some other information. The high-level takeaways from the Bloomberg report are really that these industries are having a huge impact on the U.S. energy sector that natural gas and renewables are increasing in market share, largely at the expense of some of the more conventional resources of energy. And one of the key reasons for this is the steep decline in the cost of these technologies. Um, the report itself looks over the last five years, so between 2007, eight time frame to 2012. Some of the key findings are that on the electricity production, that installations of renewable energy have doubled between that, in that five-year period. Wind had a record year in 2012 with 13.7 gigawatts installed. And, oh, I'm sorry, I think, yes, that's correct. Um, solar energy is also up. I'm trying to find my figure on solar energy. Renewable energy itself in total has grown to 12.1 percent. Uh, natural gas also had a banner year. Um, it's up 22 percent. So it now provides 31 percent of energy electricity production in the United States. And together, renewables and natural gas now um, provide 57 percent of U.S. electricity production. So that's a pretty dramatic change in the electricity sector. Um, and again, the key cost for the uh, increase in these technologies is the declining cost of the technology. So solar, the cost of solar has dropped from 31 cents to 14 cents per kilowatt hour, and wind has dropped from 9 cents to 8 cents. 
On energy consumption, there's also an interesting story that the Bloomberg report has found, and that is that despite a slight increase in the gross domestic product over that five-year time frame, that energy use has declined by 6.4%. So everyone attributes that decline, or a lot of people to, to contribute that decline in energy use to a depressed economy because of the Great Recession. But GDP actually grew at a very modest 3% increase. And despite that, uh, energy production has fell, or energy use has dropped by 6.4%, which to us uh, showcases the fact that economic growth can occur while we're using less energy. Um, so some of the factors that have contributed to this have, are that energy efficiency is really becoming a national priority and the expenditures by utilities in energy efficiency programs has increased. They are now spending $7 billion, or they spent $7 billion in 2011. Uh, the energy intensity of commercial buildings has also dropped 40% since 1980. And investments in smart grid topped $4 billion, with 46 million smart meters being deployed. So the end result of all of these investments and this greater use of these clean energy technologies has been a big impact on CO2 emissions in the United States. So over that five-year time period, emissions declined 13 percent, dropping to 1994 levels here in the United States. So again, we think that the information and the facts in this fact book show that U.S. emissions can decline while still maintaining and increasing economic growth. So I think that these figures have been well received as we've been presenting them to policymakers on the Hill and at the states. Uh, we commend this information to anybody who's interested in knowing what's happening today and on the ground. I think one of the most compelling things that I hear Bloomberg say as they make presentations for us about the information in the fact book is that Things are changing so rapidly that it's very important to have very current information. So if you're looking at information that's over six months old, it's probably already out of date. So this too will need to be updated over time. But right now we think it's the most up-to-date uh, information about what's going on in the market. And I would be happy to answer any of your questions about it. And please feel free to pick up some of our materials. The, the, there's a URL on our website for the full 90-page report. Uh, the information that we are distributing is really a summary, but the 90-page report is there and has some quick facts and links for you to review on any of the technologies that you're interested in. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Ruth. And, and I really do encourage you to look at the fact book. I think you'll find it very, very interesting. We're now going to hear from Carl Gaywell, who is the Executive Director for the Geothermal Energy Association. Geothermal is a technology and a resource that I think is often so overlooked, and yet we have an abundant resource that is usable in many, many forms. Carl? Thank you, Carol. For those in the audience, I Green light. Thank you. Um, the other renewables sometimes. I think the biomass and hydropower and geothermal people often feel like we don't quite get the respect that you deserve. But, you know, wind and solar are doing great things. They're really growing well and the technology is really moving forward. So it's their comment. But I think good things are happening across the sector in the renewable industry. And I think that's what I want to talk to you about with geothermal. Worldwide, we've seen a world market growing at double digits. We have over 70 countries that are looking at geothermal projects today from 25. Those 70 countries represent about a third of the people alive today in the world. So I mean, the resource is already being exploited in very, very large areas. In the United States, we're actually a little bit behind that curve. We're looking at sort of single-digit growth rates last year at about 4.5%. Uh, but the U.S. has maintained a strong technological lead in this whole area because we've, uh, I think in, in part, been one of the leaders in it since the early 60s when we first started projects in the United States, but also, frankly, our resource isn't as good. 
Now, the good news about not having a resource which isn't as good as, for example, Indonesia or East Africa is the U.S. companies to develop the U.S. resource have learned a lot of new technology and new techniques and I think are viewed as some of the premier companies around the world. And I think XM and OPEC and others have supported U.S. companies working in almost every continent except Antarctica at the moment. And there's a little growth chart in the pack you just see, and you can see the slope of the world market growth is significantly nicer than the U.S. growth. But the U.S. has not been uh, not moving forward. Since 2005, we've seen a renewed growth in the U.S. geothermal industry. We've seen over 500 megawatts of plants added, uh, 30 projects, uh, and a lot of new technology, hybrid plants with uh, putting together photovoltaics with solar, uh, and we've also seen real growth in what's called binary power technology, which is a technology developed in the U.S. in the 80s, which allows you to produce power from lower temperature resources. And we've seen resources as low as China Hot Springs at, what, 160 degrees Fahrenheit producing power to run their resort. And that's really been most of the growth in the United States. So we've seen the resource go from high temperature West Coast resources in California, and you'll see the charts and maps in here, to a resource which expands from the Gulf Coast up through North Dakota and across the west from Alaska and Hawaii. For over a third of the land mass of the country now has projects under development, and a lot of that is because of new technology developments in terms of being able to use a lower temperature resource, mass produce power service equipment, and also use new resources. For example, in both North Dakota and the Gulf states, they're looking at co-production of geothermal power from oil and gas wells, which there are thousands of oil and gas wells which produce lots of hot water. And right now, the oil industry buys electricity from the grid to pump that water up and then to pump the water back down. So there's some new developments which I think are really fueling some of the growth you'll see in the charts that you've laid out here. And um, you can get a lot of this more detailed information. We have a booth here at the GEA. We have an international market report which looks at what's going on around the world. We also have copies of our, our annual update. Every year we put an update that shows where the projects are, who's developing them, what's their stage of development, and those are available as well at our, at our booth. Um, but I guess since this is the policy forum, I should talk for a minute about where we could go. I mean, the USGS did an estimate looking at the U.S. resource potential. We show something around 10,000 megawatts of identified sites where we know there's resource that have not been developed. The USGS said there's somewhere between 30 and 80,000 megawatts still out there of conventional systems. This isn't EGS or advanced technology. The problem with it is most of them we can't find. We don't, have, we don't use and have the same kind of technology as the oil and gas industry as we're a very small industry, but there's a lot of techniques which are just being used, utilized from the oil and gas field in the geothermal field. And our hope is that if technology can reduce the risk of finding and producing from the subsurface, the surface side is pretty easy. As Scott said, you know, you're basically boiling water and turning a turbine. We're bringing hot water out of the ground. The problem isn't dealing with the water, the problem is finding the resource under the ground. But if technology could be developed to help us reduce the risk, that would make a big difference because what holds us back? Single digit growth, could it be double digit growth? Well, one is the high risk of resource. I mean, we're talking about projects which, you know, you might spend $10 million on a well, maybe more. And I've, I've been told by some of my company finance officers, it doesn't take too many $10 million dry holes to discourage investors. So it's high risk, and yet, you don't have the same return as if you're drilling an oil and gas well. You drill an oil and gas well and you hit the resource, what do you got? You've got money in the bank. With the geothermal field, you've maybe got a resource and now you've got to figure out what to do with it and see if you can get the permits and see if you can negotiate with the power company. I mean, it might take you another five or ten years to develop it. So there's also long lead times between the time you invest your money and the time you're going to get a return. So we've got high risk on the subsurface, very early, which is usually high risk capital. You're not going to get a loan for that. You're going to mortgage your house or something else to do the initial exploration. You've got longer lead times than there's, there, there need to be. And often we're finding ourselves fitting into regimes that were really built for other vehicles. For example, the production tax credit. We love being in the production tax credit. It's helped spur industry growth. But the production tax credit really does work better for projects which have much shorter lead times than projects which take five to seven years to build. I mean, Congress just passed a big change for us. The under construction rule makes geothermal projects much fit better in the production tax credit. But when you had a credit that was being extended one or two years at a time with an industry that takes five years to build projects, it was a bit of a mismatch. So the, the, the incentives have been there at the state and federal level, but often they're not designed with since geothermal in mind. And lastly, technology. We're just starting to see some of the subsurface types of technology, like uh, horizontal seismic work, which is done in the oil and gas industry routinely, is brand new in the geothermal industry. And how that images heat in, in the rocks and fissures in the rocks 
is still something we need to learn to do. There's a lot of room for technological improvement, but the support for that has been very, very minimal. You can see there's a chart of the DOE research budget in your, in your packet. Up until 2008, 2009, it was barely enough to cost share one exploration well. So you don't get very far doing that. In recent years, they've had a very aggressive program. We, in fact, the industry, I think, is really thrilled with their new program manager, Doug Hollett, who is, for 20 years, was the head of the uh, uh, unconventional oil and gas resource division and exploration division at Marathon Oil. And he's bringing a lot of that expertise to him to apply to the geothermal field. We think with some continued work, continued support to grow out the industry, we could be seeing the U.S. industry in double-digit growth rates just like the world industry. So uh, at the moment, I would say we're seeing strong growth. Oh, my timer tells me I'm done. Uh, around the world, we're seeing the U.S. maintain a strong export role in East Africa, Indonesia, and elsewhere. Uh, it's, a great, it's great to feel like you're a leader in something. And around the world, the U.S. is viewed as a leader in geothermal. And we want to see the U.S. market catch up to the world market in the next few years. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Carl. And I hope you all realize the enormous uh, wealth of, of information and experience that is in this panel. And please make sure that you uh, follow up at, in the expo with their exhibits and, and have further conversations. So we will now turn to Mike Hartley, who is the Director of Structured Finance with Standard Solar, Inc. Mike? Right. Uh, Standard Solar is uh, a residential and commercial installer of PV systems. Uh, we're based out of Rockville, Maryland. Uh, and today I'm going to give a, a talk uh, about um, looking into the future a little bit uh, to 2016. Uh, as some of you are probably aware, uh, the solar industry uh, has had a great uh, success story, a great growth story over the past several years. Uh, and that has been fueled uh, in part by uh, federal and state incentives. Uh, so there's a 30% investment tax credit uh, from the federal level, as well as uh, depreciation benefits uh, that provide a, a large incentive to the solar industry. Uh, and then there are a myriad of uh, state-level incentives in places like California, uh, New Jersey, Maryland, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, and those state-level incentives uh, at this point make or break uh, a solar project uh, from a, an economic perspective. Um, uh, but looking into 2016, we see that the investment tax credit uh, is going to be reduced from 30 percent to 10 percent. Uh, and so uh, this begs the question, you know, are we on the right path to uh, reducing costs uh, to, uh, by 2016 to create a sustainable uh, industry uh, that we can con continue the success story uh, without uh, substantial federal incentives and also without uh, state incentives? Uh, so right now, uh, for residential systems, we're in about 325 to 375 a watt. That's uh, you know three three dollars seventy five cents per watt uh, for a PV system. For commercial systems, we're about two dollars and twenty five cents a watt to two dollars and seventy five cents a watt. So there's we get some economies of scale in in the commercial uh, projects, uh, and and we're competing against uh, the retail cost of power with residential and commercial systems. Uh, so we're using a policy called net metering, which allows us to essentially run a, a business's electricity meter backwards uh, at times when we're producing electricity, provide them a bill credit. Uh, so that's another state-level incentive that allows us to compete with uh, the, the grid, essentially. Um, and uh, what we really need is to uh, look at the costs that we have today and figure out how we can get those costs down from, say, from a commercial project $2.75 down to uh, $1.75 or $1.50. Uh, we think if we can get to that level, uh, then we can be competitive with uh, the grid without significant federal and state incentives. Um, and, and so that's what our industry is, uh, is focused on in terms of uh, significant cost reductions. We've already seen a substantial amount of cost reductions uh, primarily from the hardware side. Uh, the cost of panels has fallen tremendously uh, as places like, uh, like China, 
have ramped up uh, their production of, of solar panels. Uh, we've also seen some, uh, some trade disputes happen uh, because the, the price of panels fell so quickly that some of the domestic manufacturers were caught a little bit by surprise. Um, but I think overall those reductions in prices are good for the industry and we really need to focus on those uh, and continue uh, to, to move forward on those. Um, so again, I said, you know, we need to get to this $1.75 per watt or less, um, and we're going to do that by continued hardware cost reductions as well as significant soft cost reductions. Now, what are the soft costs in a solar project? Well, that's the, you know, the development uh, cycle that it takes to get a project from conception to installation. Uh, and there's a number of different uh, processes involved. Uh, one of the significant ones is the, the permitting costs that we have to go through with uh, municipalities, uh, as well as the interconnection costs that we have to deal with when we're working with a local utility. Um, and right now, there's a, a huge mix of, uh, of rules and regulations at the state and at the local level that make every solar project in every jurisdiction different. So we need to get some standardization uh, in those soft costs uh, and a, a look at reducing those soft costs significantly uh, so that developing a project takes less time, uh, we can do more projects with less capital, and brings the cost of the systems down. Uh, additionally, we need to uh, gain some additional acceptance in the investor community for projects. Uh, right now, a solar asset uh, is a very predictable uh, asset, ex extremely good long-term performance of the asset. The panels are warranted for 25 years. Uh, we have great field data that shows that um, you know, the, the amount of electricity the solar PV system produces is very predictable over long periods of time. So it's a great asset class. However, investors are still pr providing a, uh, or a demanding a premium to invest in solar projects. So right now, uh, cost of capital uh, for a solar project is 9 to 12 percent uh, in terms of a return on uh, investment basis. Uh, whereas if you look at other asset uh, classes, uh, you're seeing maybe you know, 5 to 6 percent is the return that's required from the investors. So we need to uh, do some additional uh, education with the investor community so they'll accept uh, solar as a very high quality, very low risk asset class, drive the cost of capital down, uh, that also helps um, to, to scale up the industry. Uh, and then the next thing that we need is for electricity prices to, uh, to increase a, a little bit. Uh, we've seen uh, in the past couple of years, due to a slowdown in the economy and uh, a great success story on the natural gas side, uh, some, some declines in electricity prices. We think that trend is going to reverse as, uh, as the economy picks up speed again. Uh, and also as uh, industry finds uh, a ton of uses for cheap natural gas, uh, as we see truck fleets uh, change from diesel to natural gas, as we see new manufacturers spring up to use cheap natural gas in manufacturing processes, uh, as even we potentially see some exports of natural gas onto the world market. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll see those increases in electricity costs over the years. Um, but how can, uh, how can the, the federal and the, and the state policymakers help us get to this tipping point prior to 2016 when, uh, when our investment tax credit uh, is reduced. Uh, one of the things that you can do is you know, make sure that we at least have certainty that the 30% investment tax credit does go all the way to 2016 uh, so to provide us with uh, some certainty uh, in that policy environment. And then consider potentially a step down um, from 30% um, you know, gradually to 10% uh, rather than have a big cliff for us. Um, another thing to do would be to preserve the depreciation benefits that we enjoy today, the, the five-year accelerated schedule. Uh, it's a very important benefit for our investors. Um, and then uh, look to passage of some climate legislation, uh, carbon tax legislation uh, that, that also reflects uh, you know, the, some of these externalities in our traditional fossil fuel-based electricity prices. So if uh, fossil fuels had a, some sort of a carbon price on them, uh, it would help us be more competitive as a, as a carbon-free electricity source. Um, and uh, additionally, uh, we'd like some, uh, some support from 
federal government agencies and state agencies in terms of directly purchasing electricity from solar facilities. Uh, we've already seen some good work from the Department of Defense and other civilian agencies, as well as some states have gotten into purchasing solar electricity directly. So those, those, uh, those things help. And I'm, I'm getting a, uh, a look here. So I just want to uh, review very quickly um, on the state level, uh, defend the RPS policies that are currently in place, defend the net metering policies that are currently in place, and look to expand those in states where they don't exist already. Great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's lots that needs to be done, and I think that we would hear from businesses throughout how important some certainty is and some consistency for, for planning purposes, just like what we all need. So our last speaker on this panel to finish this up is taking another twist with regard to solar, and that's Stan Greshner, who is the Vice President for Government Relations with Grid Alternatives. Stan. Thanks, Carol. Uh, again, my name is Stan Greshner with uh, Grid Alternatives. Uh, just a little background on uh, Grid Alternatives, we're a uh, 501c3 nonprofit solar installer, so kind of have a very unique perspective uh, and a unique model within the industry. Um, so we're, uh, and we also administer at the, in California, where we're headquartered, the low income solar rebate program on behalf of uh, the Public Utilities Commission there. Um, we use a a volunteer-based installation model similar to what Habitat for Humanity does for construction, home construction. We do the same thing for solar, so work with uh, job training organizations throughout the state to give their students hands-on experience uh, required to get um, you know, jobs in the industry. And what I want to talk a little bit about today is how smart solar policies continue to expand uh, the, the the solar adopter base. And we had a very interesting conversation in California uh, last year about um, you know, California's solar programs and who they were benefiting. And one of the negatives that were, was being repeated there was that solar was perceived to be a technology that only wealthier families could benefit from. And maybe you know, five, six years ago, that was true. Um, but as uh, my colleague here was talking about, solar prices have come down significantly over the past three years. Solar financing models have um, been developed and matured over the past several years that have made solar um, accessible to all types of families and our organization uh, in collaboration with um, you know, policymakers and the, the solar industry has made it even available to to low-income communities and families. Um, so just, uh, just want to give an overview of um, California's model. Again, this is low-income solar is not something you think of traditionally. It was pioneered in California, um, and we've been talking to a lot of different states who've called on us to um, come talk to them um, as they're exploring different uh, solar financing models um, to see if they have something that can be included. Uh, in, in their state programs. So it's, you know, when you talk about low-income solar, inevitably you have to think creatively. It's not something that you've likely discussed in the past, so, and it's not, a, you know, a model that the general market can easily transfer over to the low-income solar market. So in California, we have an energy efficiency component um, that, you know, we've talked about in the loading order of most important things to do first is reduce the consumption at the, at the household level and then install a solar system um, that is based on you know, a, a lower load. Uh, there's a higher incentive for low-income families. We have the workforce development component. Again, this is a value to the, the, indus the whole solar market, the whole solar industry in California um, to develop a trained um, workforce and through the low income program the state is a is achieving that in part and of course having more community engagement and community education by getting folks like yourself out on an installation up on a roof to um, help install solar and actually touch and feel the technology and see that it's not a space age thing that you know is not accessible to you anyone can do it and it's a fairly simple technology there's two major components 
panels, an inverter, and then a bunch of wires. So, I mean, you need trained pros, to, professionals to do it, but um, it, it's not that complicated. Um, so why solar for low-income families? It's a conversation that, you know, again, three or four years ago, we found ourselves having to initiate all the time. But over the, you know, or through the past year or two, it's been a conversation that's been initiated by policymakers and regulators who've reached out to us to asking how, A, we're interested in doing this. The solar industry is mature, maturing in our state. You know, we have the early adopter base covered. How do we continue to expand uh, the accessibility of solar to other market segments, including low income, renters, others who might not traditionally have, um, be able to, you know, purchase uh, panels for, for their roof space. Um, so for the low income side, you know, there's, a, um, the economic returns are much better for low income families than um, general con consumers because they pay a higher proportion of their take home income on energy needs. Um, so by reducing their energy costs, they really have a significant amount of um, money back in the home that can be used for very important, um, you know, food, clothing, education for their kids. Uh, there's an environmental justice component. Um, the where power plants, traditional power plants, cited often in low-income communities. Uh, in California, you know, there's higher rates of asthma in these areas in children. So there's certainly an environmental justice component to ensuring there's equitable access to solar energy. Uh, on the job side, again, this is one of the fastest growing uh, segments in, in California or any state that has a strong uh, solar policies. And these communities um, that we serve have a uh, tremendous need for new employment opportunities and uh, job training, jobs. And th again, these are all local jobs, um, especially rooftop solar installation. These aren't jobs that go across state, go, go overseas. These are jobs that stay in the local community or in the, in the local county traditionally. Um, and it moves the conversation beyond the early adopter um, phase that, you know, solar is not just for an elite group of people, but hey, if we have a low income solar program, we're highlighting that it is accessible to, to all types of families. Um, so as my colleague was mentioning, you know, there's uh, a lot of, um, on the policy side, things that make uh, solar programs successful, which are the same for, for low income. It's still a, a new market segment that we're trying to reach, so it does continue to n need price support. So a dedicated budget or um, some sort of incentive or rebate structure that can be leveraged by low income families. Unfortunately, the ITC that you're talking about, you need a high credit score or you need tax liability that takes advantage of that 30%. Low-income families traditionally don't have that. Um, so we do our best as a nonprofit to fundraise for that gap that <laughs> um, other families might have um, available to them. And, you know, there's a, a long-term vision for solar. Is this a, um, a technology that we want to see grow and expand and um, be inclusive of all communities, all families, um, and so that long-term vision helps propel, I, I think, the industry forward. And so as, you know, we've been talking um, to other states, you know, we have a strong California presence. Um, we've spoken to Colorado, who in their solar gardens program um, have a f set aside for low income. We're talking to um, folks in New, New York right now um, to include something in, in their programs that they're discussing. And of course, we do a lot of work in tribal areas throughout California. And a few years ago, we had a discussion with in DC here and with the DC Sustainable Energy Utility. And just last year, they installed a bunch of, or several community solar projects in wards seven and eight here in, in DC, um, which are low income uh, wards to to really pilot a low-income program here. So solar is becoming more available uh, to consumers. And on the policy and regulatory side, um, you know, if 
in DC, I know a lot of you are probably renters, and you say, I can't go solar. Well, there's, without the right policies in place and support from utilities, it's a challenge for you to go solar. But with solar, community solar gardens or shared solar programs, and I don't know if standard solar works with sh shared solar developments, but that would be a, a development where it's based in your local community that you can buy a share in this bigger bigger system. So these are the types of policies that move the whole you know, industry forward to include more participants. So um, I think the goal is to continue to expand the market base and you know, those of you involved in policy, energy is still a very policy and regulatory driven environment. So um, all of that happens here. So if you have any questions, we have a, a booth out in the exhibit hall as well, so we're happy to, to meet with you out there. Thank you. Great, thanks. And of course, there are lots of opportunities, as you have heard, and uh, we're dealing with a very unlevel playing field in terms of looking at renewables, but developing the market, developing the interest and awareness and consistent policies is all part of making everything work. Uh, and the more we all know, the more we can do.